Well, I think we're 19 or 20 shows in, having started this at the beginning of the year. And we're doing something this week that we've never done before. We're rerunning an episode. For a really good cause. For a really good cause. <laughs> yes, our friends, our, 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 our friend finding love, right? Yes. So let's so, talk about that. Yeah. So we've known Joan Bassos, who is the first Golden Bachelorette. And we've known her for over 30 years. She yep. was at um, one of our daughter's first birthday parties, who, and she's 31. So, yeah, over 30 Sounds years. Right. And we knew her and her husband and her four children. And we uh, had her on our podcast mm -hmm. after she was on The Golden Bachelor. And she left The Golden Bachelor a little bit early because um, one of her daughters needed her. And then she got picked to be The Golden Bachelorette. And it is airing this Wednesday, this Wednesday night, September, September 18th, 18th. And we are super right. excited. So we're running, rerunning the podcast episode where Joan talks a lot about being on the show, but also talks about her previous relationship with her husband, John, who we knew was yeah, a wonderful we're, guy. We're, we're, we're anxious to, to watch her journey on TV. Kudos to the smart people at ABC for picking a woman, um, with brains and smarts and intellect and hopefully common sense, but we're going to find out. And over the next beauty. Couple of, well, beauty for sure. That goes yeah. without saying. And, so. and we say this in all seriousness, Joan is beautiful inside and out. Like she is a good person. We are going to see her personality and I'm excited to see how she navigates um, sending, should be interesting. sending people home because she's a nice person too. So it should be interesting and we're super excited and we will, we would love you to catch the episode. Yeah. Well, be sure to watch on ABC and, and be sure to take a listen to this podcast episode, which tells you a little bit about her experience the first time around and maybe give you a little, a little teasers into what comes over the next couple of months that we'll be able to see on TV. So Who knows? give it a listen. We are The Bullets, and this is Conversations for Couples, the, the podcast. podcast. I'm Julie Bullet. I've been a family therapist for over 30 years. I'm David Bullet. I've been a divorce and family lawyer for more than 35 years. Together, we have been married for more than 37 years. In our professional practices, the two of us have been witnesses to individuals and families struggling with life's most difficult challenges. In this podcast, we will talk about the conversations we have had, the conversations we should have had, and those that every relationship needs to have in order to find success, happiness, and fulfillment. This is Conversations for Couples, the podcast. Welcome, everybody, to today's edition or episode of Conversations for Couples, a podcast. And we are particularly excited today to have a guest with us who is incredibly beautiful inside and out. She's articulate. She's smart. She is a mother, a grandmother. She was married for 32 years to her husband, John, before he passed away in 2021. You all may know her as Joan from The Golden Bachelor, but we know her as our friend. Joan Vassos, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And what a beautiful introduction. Thank you. And you are my friends. And it's so nice to be here with you. Well, it's awesome to have you here. And we want to talk to you a little bit about, let's start, start a little bit about, you know, your relationship with John, your family and, and um, all of that sort of thing. So people can get a feel for you before we talk a little bit more about what's been going on in your life lately. Sure, sure. So John, um, I met him right out of college, actually partly when I was in college, and then we became a couple and, and we both finished college and got married kind of young. These days, people are getting married so much older. We were young, we were married at 25, started having kids. We had four in six years. That's how we got to know you guys. We raised our kids together. And um, when we were just kind of getting into that stage of life where like you're looking at the future that doesn't have your kids like on a daily you driving them to practices and stuff our last child was in college we were making plans you know to travel and to maybe buy a house in florida and making all of those you know plans without your kids and john was diagnosed on valentine's day um of 2019 with pancreatic cancer and so we spent the next two years trying to find a cure, which there is no cure for pancreatic cancer, other than if you get this major surgery that you're only eligible for if it hasn't spread at all and his had spread to his liver. So mm -hmm. we flew around the country trying to get uh, be participate in studies 
he was never eligible for any of them and he passed away in 2021 um in january of 2021 so he's been gone for about three years now and um yep that's that's the lowdown. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, that's, I mean, time. that's a lot. And of course we could spend a whole another podcast talking about grief and loss and how you dealt with that. Um, and we'd, re- you know, thank you for sharing the story. And I know you were a caretaker for, for John for, you know, several years. And then, so he passes and then you kind of look at yourself as like, who am I now? Can you tell us a little bit about like that piece and, yeah. How that was. It's a really strange place to be because you don't ever imagine <laughs> that. Like you never imagine your future with the without the person that you plan to spend it with. So I, I kind of woke up one morning and thought, I don't feel like I have a future. It looked like very like like a big black abyss to me. Mm. And um and I'm still kind of coming like figuring that out. Um and it took a, a few years to decide that I didn't want to spend it alone. You know, there was a part of me that thought I, you know, I had the best thing in the world. I'm never going to find it again. And I will never find that again, obviously. But I'm looking for, you know, different things now. But I did wake up. I, you know, the one-year mark didn't do it for me, not even close. Two-year mark kind of came, really wasn't there, but thought, I'm not getting any younger. I, sh- I can't keep, like, squandering these years. I'm not getting better looking, and I'm not getting younger. So um, <laughs> I thought I need to take some action because I don't want to be alone. And... Um, I was actually out to dinner with a friend of mine. We were sitting at a bar having dinner, a girlfriend. And um, I said to her, you know, like I'm getting in my mind. It was literally like, like exactly two years. I said, I'm getting in my mind that I need to like take some kind of action. I go, my God, I really don't want to do that online dating thing. That sounds awful. And I hear horror stories and I just really don't want to do it. I said, but like, as I look around this restaurant, everybody here is a couple. Yeah. Everybody our age is a couple. And I said, um, I don't see how you meet somebody organically. Like, it just seems to be impossible. I said, because like, if I look at my son, Luke, who is 27, I said, he walks into a restaurant or a bar and says, everybody here my age is probably single. I walk into the same establishments and go, everybody here my age is probably a couple, is probably not single. So even if somebody there was single, I would assume they weren't. I would assume that they were part of a couple. So like, it requires more drastic uh, measures. Yeah, and and Joe, the, this age. You, you were not married for a short period of time. You didn't get divorced. And we talked to a lot of folks about, you know, dating the second time around, but you had your life partner. Yep. And so you had to have a lot. I imagine there was a lot more going through your head, uh, not only during that two years, but after you started to say to yourself, well, maybe I do need to make a change. Yeah. yeah and, I mean, and the so I don't mean to interrupt, but the no, other thing no. that keeps on coming into my brain is John. And what a big personality John was and what a great guy he was. And how how do you even fathom finding someone that you're not constantly comparing John to? I- yeah, that's such a good question because like it's it's a very conscious effort that I have to make that I'm looking for somebody completely different because you you guys knew John and like he's indescribable really and I always just said he left this big vacuum in the world like like a hole that will never be filled and um, so I have to you know make sure I'm not even trying to fill that that hole um, part of me thinks that you know people that have come from a divorce they have not had a good marriage so they might be more skeptical or bitter or um, you know have a harder time finding a um, a, a second love. Um, for me, I feel like it's even harder now. And I would have never thought that before um, because I had such a happy marriage and I had such a wonderful husband. And it's hard to, it's hard for, it's very hard for me to picture a life with a different person, to be perfectly honest. But I know that that things are happier when you're with somebody, the good times are better and the bad times are better when you have somebody to share them with. So I don't want to do this alone. Like I, I see yeah. my friends who are grandparents now and they're doing this grandparent journey together and I'm doing it all by myself, which wonder what yeah. it's, it's a lot of work. Holidays are exhausting. I would like to have a partner just to help me like get through the daily, you know, sometimes when you have a couple of toddlers in your house, but, um, also, it's just more fun. Like, I want to have somebody to take them to Disney World with, or yeah. I want somebody to watch the Netflix series with at night. You know, I'm not looking to replace John now. I'm not looking for a father, you know, for my kids. I'm looking right. for a partner now for me. So it's a little different. 
Yeah. So it is different. So talk about that too, because obviously we want to talk about your journey, you know, on the golden bachelor, but I I want to talk about your journey as kind of what you see, how are you going to do this? How you might find somebody, what are you looking for? Those kinds of things. Again, the process is difficult for once again, you know, you know, most people find, you know, their next at this age, well, even at younger ages, these days you're finding them through dating apps. And um, I, I have tried a dating app. I tried one in particular. I tried uh, Match.com and um, I met some people, but it seems that people aren't super truthful with their profiles, nor with their pictures. Um, so it's a little bit of a like discouraging process. And um, I found just about every person I encountered on Match.com had told something that wasn't true about themselves or presented (laughs) something that wasn't true. So So I'm a little bitter when it comes to that, which is kind of how I ended up at The Bachelor, to be perfectly honest, which is a weird way to end up on national TV dating because I got sick of the dating app. But I don't, I mean, if you have any suggestions on how to meet somebody, that would be great. But honestly, like I always thought in my mind, um, you know, somebody will set me up. Eventually somebody will will know a, a great guy and set me up. And that is like super not true. I, I think all the great guys get, you know, snapped up right away. Well, that was my, what I was getting at. So, you know, before we get to the, the, the bachelor journey, um, I want to just want to hear more about the Joan, the Joan pre TV journey. Once you hit that two years or so, you 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 jumped on the dating app. And what I imagine were there friends that fixed you up that connected you with anyone else or. And and if so, or if not, ha- tell us a little bit how those how those dates kind of went. So I, I did not really get set up by anyone, honestly. And like, I even kind of put it out there like, hey, if you, have, if you know anybody, like I'm willing to go like have a drink with somebody, have a glass of wine at a bar. Um, and I really actually I'm going out tomorrow night with somebody weirdly. I finally I've been set up now twice in the last like two months. But that was, you know, a long time coming. I mean, I've been now single for three years. So, um, and I think people didn't do it in the beginning, but then the people knew I was ready. I, I kind of thought that I would have some dates and I didn't. Um, the, the journey has been weird because the two year mark, even though in my head, I was saying to myself, it's time and I'm not getting any younger and I know what I want. My heart really wasn't very open to be honest. Yeah. I, I was going through the motions and I was trying to get excited about meeting people and going out on dates. And I had a lot of offers. And I'm not, I don't mean to sound like, um, I think everybody that goes on match or any of the dating websites in the beginning, you're very popular. You're like the new kid in town. So I think the first night when I hit like send and like submitted my profile, I had like 130 messages. It's overwhelming. And to get through, and I felt like I owed every one of these people that like actually sent a message, like uh, I should read them and look at their profiles. And I got through about half of them. And then by the next morning, the half that I gotten through now had been replaced by 50 more. Oh, so wow. it was a, it's a big, it's a big commitment. Honestly, online dating is a commitment. You have to be on your phone a lot. Yeah. You have to be answering text messages. You have to be looking at profiles. It's a job. And it's like not really a fun job. You would think it would be, oh, I'm going to meet all these great new people, like a you know, 90 for 90 percent of them aren't good matches for you. They're not yeah. age wise or, you know, place in life or whatever. They're not what you're looking for. So it's like a job, to be perfectly honest. It's not easy. And once again, like I said, my heart really wasn't in it. So yeah. it wasn't like a super pleasant experience. I have to say, I did meet some very nice, nice people. I honestly did. I don't want to make me sound like I am um like I'm too good for anybody. That wasn't true at all. There, there were some lovely people, very, very, very nice men that I met. Um, I just wasn't in a good place. So I, I wasn't probably being fair to the people that were messaging me because I, I wasn't really there yet. It took me until I went on the show to get there. And that's mm. kind, kind of part of that journey that I can talk about if you want. Yeah. yeah. So how we, so, so now talk to us about how you decided to, to go on the show, A, and B, the response from your friends and from your family in terms of whether even before you found out that you were that you were going to be on the show. Mm -hmm. So the process is a kind of a long process. So I applied for it um, earlier in the year, kind of actually the night that I got home from that, um, that meetup that I talked about with my friend and looking around the restaurant and going, nobody here is single. I turned on the TV and a huge bachelor fan and turned on my bachelor show and, the 
first commercial that came on was we're taking casting calls for a new show called The Golden Bachelor. And I was like, the universe is talking to me. Yes. So I filled out the form and then kind of forgot it. And it was a kind of a long form, submitted my pictures, did the things I was supposed to have done, and then really didn't um, think about it after that. I thought this is such a long shot. And um, then the process kind of started moving along after a few months. And I did tell a few friends, you know, I I applied for this. What do you think about it? Um, And I, I got nothing but wonderful feedback from my friends. From my kids, a little different, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My sons were like, this is so embarrassing. I cannot believe you're going to do this. You're going to date on national TV. And if you kiss somebody, we will, we'll kill you. We're like, we'll die. We'll (laughs) die of embarrassment. Never mind. Um, Go to the fantasy suite. Let's not talk about that. Right. Don't even talk about the fantasy suite. (laughs) They did. They warned me about that. Um, And then in the meantime, my daughter got pregnant and we had the whole, you know, timing of the birth and her with, you know, the postpartum issues. And so we, you know, the whole thing was a long process and I got great feedback from friends. Family was a little different. Um, two of my kids were great. Two of them were like, this is so embarrassing. We're going to die. Um, and I, I have to say, I was a little weary about the process because this was a new show. So I knew certainly what to expect from Bachelor and what they do. And some of the stuff that they do for the younger people, I would have thought may have been less than flattering for an older person to do. Mm-hmm. So I was very careful when I went on the show what I was going to be on camera doing. So I kind of hung in the background for the first like two or three days until I realized that they weren't going to, they weren't trying to embarrass us, that they really were trying to make a show about what it's like dating as an older person and that the producers are really kind people and that they really wanted this to be a huge success and that they were letting this unfold the way it just organically unfolded. And it, that came with people falling in love with Gary and us having this tribe of really good friends that supported each other through this journey. So it ended up being very different than what I thought. Um, my friends were right. It was an amazing experience. I did not embarrass my kids too much. So it ended up being wonderful. Um, but like I said, we went in, everybody went in a little weary, like a little nervous. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and you know, what, what we noticed, and we, of course, wanted to watch because you were on, uh, we generally watch now and again anyway, but yeah. but because you were on, and we, what we noticed, I think, or what I noticed was that there was a lot less uh, conflict between the, fo- the the women. There was some, clearly, yeah. but there was a lot less, the, you know, maybe it maybe it had to do with maturity. Maybe it had to do with the fact that, that, that everyone had been around the bend before, as opposed to a 22-year-old, you know, who just got out of college and was yeah. biggest concern is what, you know, what bikini I'm going to wear. You well, know, to that's the, the whole thing. Yeah. Like we all had these like rich lives that we left behind us. Yes. Right? And we've all had like, you know, all of us were there because something bad had happened in our life. Like mm. we weren't there, you know, like so many of us had experienced loss of a spouse, you know, many people divorced. Um, we had all had gone through something crappy. And mm-hmm. so the little petty things that, like that we like even me, myself when I was that age, you know, would have gotten involved in, we just didn't do it. It just, they're yeah. unimportant. We knew that we've, we're mature. Like you said, we've lived life and those things were unimportant and we weren't spending, we weren't wasting our time doing that. We were way and, more about supporting each other, patting each other on the backs and you can yeah. do this because, yeah. you know, all of us had some trepidation. We were all a little nervous being there. Mm-hmm. We were all wary. We weren't there because we had great dating success. We were there because we hadn't and that we were looking for dating success. So we were patting each other on the back and pushing each other forward and saying, you should go out on a date with him. You know, everybody needs a chance in this in this scenario to for him to find the right person and to you to test if you're the right person for him. You know, this is a two two way street. So um, we weren't about, you know, stabbing each other in the back. We were about patting each other on the back, really. And at what point cool. in time did you did you find out who this person was that you were going to meet? Were you were were you you had already been accepted onto the show. Mm-hmm. Right. Correct. So yeah. you didn't know if this was someone who was six foot eight and looked like Lurch, which, of course, we all know that wouldn't be the case or they yes. wouldn't put him on TV Correct. or yeah. you, know, you knew nothing about him. Right. Absolutely nothing about him. We found out the day that America found out when he was announced on Good Morning America. Uh-huh. Um, we actually I, I went to work late that day and I sat here in my family room and I watched the announcement just like wow. with a good friend of mine, just like you guys did. They, we found out exactly the same time. Yeah. So talk about, talk about, you know, leaving the show and how that was for you. Cause it, you know, you had invested so much time and effort from applying to being interviewed. 
when I ask a question. Oh, I got, this got in is trouble for going one. off no, topic. No, no, no. Well, you know, you just jumped ahead a little bit. So I want to fo- ask a follow-up. So you find yeah. out on Good Morning America that morning that, that this fellow, Gary from Indiana, is going to be the bachelor, the, the yep. golden bachelor. Mm-hmm. And any, what was the reaction at that point when you saw him on television? What's your first memory of, okay, there he is. I'm going to California, giving up my life in Maryland, and I'm going to go meet this yep. guy. And taking a leave of absence from work yeah. and leaving my daughter yeah. who just had a baby. And like yeah. there were a yeah. lot of things going through my mind. And I still wasn't like 100% sure that I was actually going to leave, to be totally honest. And I saw him and he seemed, I'm going to tell you two things. And one's going to make me sound not so great. And the other one's going to be okay. The, I'm going to make myself sound bad first. I thought he was too old for me. Right. So he was 70 years old. I'm 60 at the time. I just turned 60. I'm like, oh. God, I wish he had been a little younger. And mm-hmm. I think he's a little old for me. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh, but then I thought he seems like a really nice guy. And they introduced him along with his daughters. And I thought he's a really good father. And he lost his wife in a really tragic way. And I can really relate to his journey. And I thought I'm going to give it a try. Okay. So, Very good. Now yeah. ask your question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so I want to talk about you invested, you know, sort of we, we all have hopes and dreams. And I'm you know, I'm I'm thinking as you're going along, you do this application and then you get, you know, you know, picked and how exciting that is. And then you've invested, you know, what like, what are you clothes are you gonna take out? Yeah. You tell your family like Packing you packing was a shit job. I, I can't even <laughs> imagine how, what pressure Bad. there was. Is my hair look you know, do I need my roots done before I go? What do I do about like, like the day before you're done? Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's the timing there's, of everything is tough. Yeah, there's so there's so much, and you you know you you want to first of all you're, you're very genuine, and you're just a genuine person, and I I definitely felt it not because I'm your friend, but I saw the real Joan on TV, and I Thank loved you. that about you. It was you know it was you, but anyway, you invested, you're out there and taping and going through you know these dates and these different things, and then you have to make this really hard decision because your daughter needed you. So can you talk about that for you know for a bit and tell us about that part? So the timing of that was like really kind of epic because um, like I said, I had kind of like stayed in the background for a lot of it. and um, they tell us the day that we're going to do a talent show. Which, as you know, because you know me, I have no talent. I don't know. You were the best. Dance. You were the best. I do nothing. So <laughs> I was having like a little nervous breakdown and, um, you know, figured out what my talent was going to be like an hour before we were going to. They give it, you give you a couple hours to get ready. And we certainly had some really talented people on our season, you know, like Leslie and like Faith and, you know, some people and some people were just flipping funny people. Like they were great comedians. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I can't compete with any of these people, yeah. but I can weirdly rhyme words, you know, like any third grader. So <laughs> that was my, that was my talent. I can rhyme. So I wrote this poem and um, in some crazy weird universe, I won, which I think I, I have no, I, I think he just knew I was the most nervous. So he felt sorry for me, maybe um, the panel did. So I won that date. And that date was kind of like the turning point for me because I got a one-on-one, which is rare. So at that point, only Teresa had had a one I think only Teresa had had a one-on-one. So I was the second one-on-one. And, you know, in a normal season, only like five people get a one-on-one. Like you just don't get them. So I was, I knew I was really, really, really lucky to get this. And it was the first time um, in like the five days or six days or seven days that I had been there that I'd actually, would actually get to spend more than like three minutes at a time with him because your meetings throughout that time are very, very, very short. There's so many of you and he has a lot of conversations that he has to have. And I had had really short conversations that were all like nice and pleasant conversations, but you know, nothing really important and nothing that showed that maybe we had solidified any kind of, um, you know, bond at all. Mm -hmm. So we go and we don't have one of those epic dates. We don't like, we're not jumping out of plane. We're not going on a yacht. We're not doing anything like really crazy. We literally go to a beautiful antique shop and they set a, they set a table way, way, way in the back. And we just have this like kind of romantic like dinner um, that we just sit at a table and we drink wine and we have food and there are cameras there, but they kind of fade into the background, honestly. And we just talk for like three hours and we had Mm. great conversations. We just, kind of talked about like, what do you do on a Saturday morning? And, um, you know, what is your relationship with your kids? And just a normal old conversation. You guys saw like maybe one minute of that conversation mm-hmm. on TV. The rest of it was like a normal date. And by the end of that date, I thought, you know what? I think I like, I, I kind of like this guy. And I was surprised, it surprised me to be totally honest. And um, kind of for the first time, 
like I left a date and I was excited. So they take me back to the mansion and I get there and there and I get there at like one thirty in the morning. So um, it was a long date. It was really nice. And get us back to the, get me back to the mansion. I'm like, okay, somebody has got to be awake. Cause I have to talk to somebody. Like I'm like a teenager in my sorority and not a soul is awake. Every freaking person in that mansion is asleep. So I go up and I climb up into my talk bunk. My yes, top you got bunk the bunk bed. bed. Yes. And I follow, and I, and I'm trying to fall asleep and I lay there for like three hours awake and I'm just rehashing the whole date and it was good. And I kept thinking like, I really kind of like this guy. And I was like, my heart finally like feels a little open. I'm excited about seeing him again tomorrow. So, um, I woke up the next morning I go downstairs to get my coffee and my producer comes up to me and she says, I, I need to talk to you. I have something mm -hmm. for you. And she has a text message from my daughter, my daughter who, I knew that this was a possibility. Um, and the text message said, you know, I'm tanking here. I need you. And, you know, like you, you're the mom of four girls, like you and your dad of four girls, you don't ever say no when your kids yeah. say they need you. And I knew that she would have never, ever, ever called me and said she needed me unless she really did. So I was like, I, I got to get out of here. I got to leave. And it never crossed my mind that there was any other choice, but then I, and they were like, okay, you know, we'll get things going, but you have some things you have to do here. You have to say goodbye to all the women. You have to say goodbye to Gary. You, you know, you, you, we, we got a couple hours before we can get you on a flight. I didn't end up on a flight until that evening, but um, I, I walked upstairs to start packing and it all hit me that I was mm -hmm. leaving these, like at this point, there were only 15 other women, like these 15 great women who have become like my really good friends in such a short time, but we had so much in common and you spend a lot of time together and they were like my tribe. It was finally, I don't have any single friends. So I had these great friends finally that I could like share things with and they shared things with me. It was such like, it was like what I needed. It was like the therapy I needed. And then, and I was going to leave Gary and I like, it was like my journey was just cut short. It was done. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. there's no going back. You leave, you're done. And not only that, it's not like a normal relationship. You don't get to call them the next day. Right. You, you don't talk to them again while yeah. they're still filming. You don't get to have any con contact with them again. And chances are I would never have another conversation with Gary again. You know, he like, I, we, we can't talk, you know, at the end of this, supposedly he's getting married. So yes. I would be like his ex-girlfriend, you know, you can't really talk to him anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, not good. Not good for you hanging yeah, around. Yeah. <laughs> not good girlfriend behavior. So, um, it, it was, it was really heavy and you, you, and you such, a pull, accent, such a obviously. pull, such a pull like such a pull, right? Like this, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're in it, you've invested in this journey and then your kids, which are your core yep. need you. And it's sort of like such, so, so difficult. I can't imagine the decision, although, I mean, it was evident and easy because you're a mom cool. first, Yep. but really, really hard. And um, yeah. So, so you left and you sort of left with lots of losses, loss yep. of, friendships and Gary and the possibilities. Yeah. yeah. And then how did you, you know, come home and what did you do and how has it been since then? Yeah. So came home and um, my daughter just needed help getting like a little mental health care, which is so incredibly hard to get um, in a quick way when she needed it quickly. And I, I mean, honestly, we didn't get it for several weeks to be perfectly honest. And I tried yeah. my darndest and you got to think about somebody who's having a mental health crisis um, needing help is the person the least likely able to actually find it. So, um, I was like the person that they needed, you know, her husband didn't know how to do it. She didn't know how to do it. She was just keeping her head above water, trying to raise this baby and take care of it and keep it alive. And, um, you know, with no sleep and crying all the time. So, um, I, I came home and I, you know, eventually got her help and things cleared up and they are the happiest people in the world. They have a yeah. super happy baby and it's just the joy of their lives and they love being parents, but it just was that like month that she needed help and there mm -hmm. was no other person that could figure it out for her other than me. And so I was it, that was it. And I did, and you know, it wasn't easy for me to be totally honest. So, you know, I feel bad for daughters who don't have mothers that would come and do that. And I did actually, I felt like, you know, I was, um, I was made a little bit of a hero through this whole thing, which I don't think that I deserve at all. I think any good mother would have done this, but I did get a lot of reactions from people on social media saying, oh my God, you're the best mother ever. My mother didn't do that for me. And I was like, you got ripped off. You got a crappy mother because she yeah. should have. Yeah, no, no, it, right. it took, you know, it, it, it took a lot. 
for you to do that. And, and, and I, I, frankly, I could, I could see folks who, who are good parents, uh, really struggling with that decision, you know, having turned their lives upside down, not really been interested in seeing anyone. And then all of a sudden, well, maybe there is something here only to be pulled back out. And, and, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about that when, when it happened and, and, Obviously, I think I would have done the same thing. I think Julie would have done the same thing. But I can see how how folks would struggle with that decision. Not necessarily folks who were, you know, not the greatest parents in the world, but people who are who are in a stage of life where it's those are hard decisions. They can be hard decisions. And for you, like us, you know, you know, the kids are coming first, and we're going to do what we got to do, and that's it. Um, and and I think you, you, while you may not feel yourself a hero, you certainly made a very, very difficult decision that 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 resulted in you, again, putting your personal life back on hold for a bit. And I think you do deserve credit for that. I mean, I, I, you know, hero is what we make them to be. But but we but the two of us looked at each other and said, you know, that was Joan. She couldn't have made another decision. And, yeah. and, you, and you do deserve a pat or two on the back for that. But let me ask you one question. Yeah. So I'm watching you and I'm watching Gary. And I'm saying to myself, I knew John. Not wasn't close friends with John, but John's yep. personality filled a room. Yep. I, Gary struck me as not, you know, as just not being your type. You know, you do this when you watch the battle. Should they be with mm-hmm. she be with him? Okay. Yeah, that way. So I said to Julie, nah, this was before you, you know, you left. I'm saying, I don't know if Gary's her kind of I don't know. You know, so was there any of that going through your head, or am I just way off base? No, no, there certainly was. You're very, you know, you're right on base, honestly. Um, you do get caught up kind of in this weird bubble that you're in. And you, um, let me, I, I should say a couple of really nice things about Gary, because first of all, he's very gregarious and he's also very open. And the thing that I needed to learn on this journey was how to open mm-hmm. my heart. And he mm-hmm. did it so well. So yeah, awesome. I, I think that yeah. I felt a closest to him because he was able to do that. And I was learning from him. Like, this is, this is how you become open. This is how you become vulnerable. And he was coming, becoming vulnerable for 21 people. I just had to do it for one. And he was really good at it. And he was really listened to you and he made you feel valued. And I think that, um, that made me feel really good. Like that, um, like he was vulnerable for me and I could do it back to him and not feel intimidated. So there were certain aspects like of the, like this very short relationship that were unique to to me. I hadn't felt it before. So, um, but when it comes to, like you said, the big personality and the type of person I'm normally attracted to and I ended up marrying, um, he was different than that. He was certainly different than John. Yeah. But, but something I want to kind of circle back around, which you mentioned sort of highlighted is that you are probably looking for something different. You can't feel, you can't find another John or, I mean, you're never going to be able to replace him, but you might be going in a different direction. And Gary would really be a different, you know, different in that way from, from what we saw, of course, we saw like, you know, teeny tiny snippets. So I wonder if that's something that you're going to be, you know, sort of going forward looking for something different. Yeah, I really don't know. I think it's just going to present itself to me, like the person that I'm going to like um, or fall in love with. Um, you know, at the time I was thinking it could have been Gary. And like now I look back at it and I go, oh, it definitely couldn't have been. Like, I, I don't see that now at all. Um, and yeah. even like producers have said that to me. So I'm, this mm-hmm. is like no secret to the world yeah. that um, that maybe he wouldn't have been a great, perfect match for me. But at the time it felt good. And um I, I have absolutely no vision in my head of what I'm looking for. And I that's what I was going to ask person. you. That's exactly what I was going to ask you is, you know, it, where do you see yourself going from here? I'm not talking about batch the, the show, but in terms yeah. of your life, in terms of your life, where do you see yourself going from here? So like, again, I, I certainly see myself with another person, but you know, I also think I have a great life. You know, I have great kids and grandchildren and, um, you know, I, I don't have to have somebody. I'm not, I'm not looking for somebody to save me or to fill a big hole. Mm-hmm. It's a little hole. So it's the person that, um, like, I'm going to come home after work and turn on that great Netflix series and have somebody to watch it with while you eat my mm-hmm. like, carry out. Or, yeah. like, I'm missing those things. And once again, like, all my friends are couples. Yeah. So 
I go out with my girlfriends, like Julie, I've gone out with you. It's mm-hmm. like, I love it, but I leave and I go home to an yeah. empty house. You go home to your, your husband. Yeah. I, go, I come home to an empty house and I rely on Netflix and, yeah. and the bachelor show and that kind of stuff to keep me entertained at night. Yeah. So I, I would really love someone to share my life with. I don't have to have that person. I'm not going to settle. I'm going to find mm-hmm. a match that I will spend the rest of my life with. I'm not going to settle for somebody. So if I find that great, if I don't, it'll be okay too. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so the question that everybody wants, you know, us to ask that is she's not going to answer, but that, ask you, it any. that you probably can't answer, <laughs> which is what's next. Are you going to be the next golden bachelorette or like, what's going to happen here, Joan? Yeah. Tell well, us like nobody is- else is listening. Yeah, Marina's- sure. <laughs> um, so the good news is there's going to be a golden bachelorette, which is like the big yes. announcement finally came like last month. So, um, you know, I think that if you asked every single girl on my show, everyone would say they'd want to be it. And I'm right there with them. Bachelor That's a credit really, to the show. It really yeah, it that is says good. a lot because yeah, it's not but, coming from a, like I said, it's not coming from a 23 year old. It's coming no, from someone no. like you who's, who's, um, been around and understands I mean, I have things. To, I really have to give it to The Bachelor. They do a great job of bringing good people on the show and the people that are part of Bachelor Nation, the, um, the producers and the executive producers, and even like the cameramen, you become really good friends with everyone. You spend an nice. insane amount of time together. You live in a mansion together. You're together all the, all the time and they really get to know you. So I think that this batch of, um, of women, our, our people, the producers know us really well. So I think when they choose one and they go to find a man or a group of men for this person, they're going to do a really good job because they're going to, they know us. Yeah, that's true. So, so we get to follow you because you're our friend wherever, you know, wherever you go, if you end up being the, the next golden bachelor or, or not, but where can people find you? Where can people follow you? How can people you know, vote for you to become the next golden bachelorette. So I don't think there's a voting process. I don't, I've never (laughs) seen one. I think, so I know on Bachelor Nation, they look at their um, Instagram, Bachelor Nation and Golden Bachelor both have Instagrams. And so I know that they look at theirs. Um, And, um, you know, I have my own Instagram and I have my own TikTok. I actually am in that world now. So honestly, like when I came off of Golden Bachelor, I, um, I don't know if I, I know you watched the episode where I said, like, I felt finally like a little less invisible Mm, and I really wasn't ready to let that go. So I wasn't ready to go back and be, um, like in the backseat. I feel like at Mm -hmm. this age in my life and this age in all of our lives, like we're expected to let the next generation come and take over and we're expected to take a backseat. And I just feel like I'm not ready to do that yet. Like I'm not ready just to be the old lady grandma that's like supporting my kids. I still have a life. So I thought I have to try to remain relevant. And the way you remain relevant, you know, these days is with technology. So I went and got myself a TikTok and an Instagram. So I have those now. I started with 300 followers and now I have like, I think I have like 30,000 or something like that. That's awesome. Well, For those of us who know you, Joan, and certainly people who saw you on television and have followed your journey since then, you are anything but invisible. And you are anything but someone who belongs in the back seat, unless it's on a good date, I guess. (laughs) Uh, um, But we're not going to, we'll save that for another discussion. (laughs) But but you, you, you know, you, you, I think provide a lot of hope for folks um, in their sixties and older or Mm fifties and older Mm -hmm. That there is, there is more than just, and not there's anything wrong with it, but there is, there is a personal side that you're allowed to live um, later in life. And so we thank you so much for being honest and open with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. We hope you'll come back and we can follow your journey, whether it's on TV or not on TV, but we would love to have you come back. And it's been so great to see you. You and too. for those Thank of us, you. those of you out there who are, who, who follow us and listen to our podcast, we're www.thebullets, T-H-E-B-U-L-I-T-T-S website. We're at The Bullets on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and LinkedIn for some inexplicable reason. Uh, we will see everybody next time. Joan Vassos, you are the greatest. Go get them. We know that you will. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. It was great talking to you guys. Nice talking Mwah. to you. Mwah. 
Julie Bullitt is a professionally licensed clinical social worker and family therapist. David Bullitt is a divorce and family lawyer. Julie is not your therapist and David is not your lawyer. This podcast is meant for educational and entertainment purposes only.